Pro, from a mere placeholder into a number that made sense in its own right. A number for calculation, for investigation. This brilliant conceptual leap would revolutionise mathematics. Now, with just ten digits, zero to nine, it was suddenly possible to capture astronomically large numbers in an incredibly efficient way. But why did the Indians make this imaginative leap? Well, we'll never know for sure, but it's possible that the idea and symbol that the Indians used for zero came from calculations they did with stones in the sand. When stones were removed from the calculation, a small round hole was left in its place, representing the movement from something to nothing. But perhaps there's also a cultural reason for the invention of zero. For the ancient Indians, the concepts of nothingness and eternity lay at the very heart of their belief system. In the religions of India, the universe was born out of nothingness, and nothingness is the ultimate goal of humanity. So it's perhaps not surprising that a culture that so enthusiastically embraced the void should be happy with the notion of zero. The Indians even used the word for the philosophical idea of the void, shunya, to represent the new mathematical term zero. In the 7th century, the brilliant Indian mathematician Brahmagupta proved some of the essential properties of zero. Brahmagupta's rules about calculating with zero are taught in schools all over the world to this day. One plus zero equals one. One minus zero equals one. One times zero is equal to zero. But Brahmagupta came a cropper when he tried to do one divided by zero. After all, what number times zero equals one? It would require a new mathematical concept, that of infinity, to make sense of dividing by zero. And the breakthrough was made by a 12th century Indian mathematician called Bhaskara II. And it works like this. If I take a fruit and I divide it into halves, I get two pieces. So, one divided by half is two. If I divide it into thirds, I get three pieces. So when I divide it into smaller and smaller fractions, I get more and more pieces. So ultimately, when I divide by a piece which is of zero size, I'll have infinitely many pieces. So for Bhaskara, one divided by zero is infinity. <laughs> But the Indians were to go further in their calculations with zero. For example, if you take three from three and get zero, what happens when you take four from three? It looks like you have nothing. But the Indians recognize that this was a new sort of nothing, negative numbers. The Indians called them debts because they were perfect for solving equations like, if I have three batches of material and take four away, how many have I left? This may seem odd and impractical, but that was the beauty of Indian mathematics. Their ability to come up with negative numbers and zero was because they thought of numbers as abstract entities. They weren't just for counting and measuring pieces of cloth. They had a life of their own, floating free of the real world. This led to an explosion of mathematical ideas. The Indian's abstract approach to mathematics soon revealed a new side to the problem of how to solve quadratic equations. That is, equations including numbers to the power of two. 
Brahmagupta's understanding of negative numbers allowed him to see that quadratic equations always have two solutions, one of which could be negative. Brahmagupta went even further, solving quadratic equations with two unknowns, a question which wouldn't be considered in the West until 1657, when the French mathematician Fermat challenged his colleagues with the same problem. Little did he know that they'd been beaten to a solution by Brahmagupta a thousand years earlier. Brahmagupta was beginning to find abstract ways of solving equations. But astonishingly, he was also developing a new mathematical language to express that abstraction. Brahmagupta was experimenting with ways of writing his equations down, using the initials of the names of different colours to represent unknowns in his equations. A new mathematical language was coming to life, which would ultimately lead to the X's and Y's which filled today's mathematical journeys. But it wasn't just new notation that was being developed. Indian mathematicians were responsible for making fundamental new discoveries in the theory of trigonometry. The power of trigonometry is that it acts like a dictionary translating geometry into numbers and back. Although first developed by the ancient Greeks, it was in the hands of the Indian mathematicians that the subject truly flourished. At its heart lies the study of right-angled triangles. In trigonometry, you can use this angle here to find the ratios of the opposite side to the longest side. There's a function called the sine function, which when you input the angle, outputs the ratio. So for example, in this triangle, the angle is about 30 degrees. So the output of the sine function is a ratio of one to two, telling me that this side is half the length of the longest side. The sine function enables you to calculate distances when you're not able to make an accurate measurement. To this day, it's used in architecture and engineering. The Indians used it to survey the land around them, navigate the seas, and ultimately chart the depths of space itself. It was central to the work of observatories like this one in Delhi, where astronomers would study the stars. The Indian astronomers could use trigonometry to work out the relative distance between the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and the Sun. You can only make the calculation when the Moon is half full, because that's when it's directly opposite the Sun. So the Sun, Moon and Earth create a right-angled triangle. Now the Indians could measure that the angle between the sun and the observatory was one-seventh of a degree. The sine function of one-seventh of a degree gives me the ratio of 400 to 1. This means the sun is 400 times further from the earth than the moon is. So using trigonometry, the Indian mathematicians could explore the solar system without ever having to leave the surface of the earth. The ancient Greeks had been the first to explore the sine function, listing precise values for some angles. But they couldn't calculate the signs of every angle. The Indians were to go much further, setting themselves a mammoth task. The search was on to find a way to calculate the sine function of any angle you might be given. breakthrough in the search for the sine function of every angle will be made here in Kerala in South India. In the 15th century, this part of the country became home to one of the most brilliant schools of mathematicians to have ever worked. Their leader was called Madhava, and he was to make some extraordinary mathematical discoveries. 
The key to Madhava's success was the concept of the infinite. Madhava discovered that you could add up infinitely many things with dramatic effects. Previous cultures have been nervous of these infinite sums, but Madhava was happy to play with them. For example, here's how one can be made up by adding infinitely many fractions. I'm heading from zero to one on my boat, but I can split my journey up into infinitely many fractions. So I can get to a half, then I can sail on a quarter, then an eighth, then a sixteenth, and so on. The smaller the fractions I move, the nearer to one I get. But I'll only get there once I've added up infinitely many fractions. Now, physically and philosophically, it seems rather a challenge to add up infinitely many things. But that's the power of mathematics, to make sense of the impossible. By producing a language to articulate and manipulate the infinite, you can prove that after infinitely many steps, you'll reach your destination. Such infinite sums are called infinite series, and Madhava was doing a lot of research into the connections between these series and trigonometry. First, he realized that he could use the same principle of adding up infinitely many fractions to capture one of the most important numbers in mathematics, pi. Pi is the ratio of the circle's 